Good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome to our midweek, midday Bible study. It is 12 noon Wednesday, and this is September the 2nd. Good to see you, Brother Hill and Latanya, praying for you. Uh, I know you had surgery recently. Julia, bless you. Barbara and Miss Woods, good to see all of y'all today. We are going to, this is our third week on uh, prayer as a means to hear the voice of God. Charmin Mitchell, bless you. Sister Scott, God bless you. Uh, this is our third week. And this, this particular part of the study has been talking about what prayer is and what prayer isn't. Julius Dix, former um, Minister of Music at Providence. Good to see you on the line today. We appreciate. It's been a year since I've seen you, Brother Dix. I look forward to connecting with you soon. Brother Ali, good to see you. Tanya Arnold and Sister Rose. Toya, bless you. Good to see you all today. This is the third week on prayer as a means to hear the voice of God. And our subtopic, what prayer is and what prayer isn't. Good to see you, Miss Stafford. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for another day, for your blessings and grace, and for the privilege of gathering virtually. We lift up this study today, God, and pray that it would benefit us, that it would bless us, and that you would open our minds and our hearts to receive your word, and that we might further understand the role that prayer plays in hearing your voice when you speak to us. We claim your victory for our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you again for joining uh, Marie Dumas. Uh, that's good to see you, Sister Dumas, praying for your family, Brother Woods. God bless you. Learning or, or hearing God's voice is our main topic, and we're talking about the role of prayer. Let's start with the first question, and I hope that you pulled the outline from the church Facebook page. The first part of this study talks about how, or raises the question, I'm sorry, how should we pray? And we're going to probably be a little shorter than normal today, uh, but the first part of the study again raises the question, how should we pray? Let's begin with this thought. Prayer is a gift to us, granted by God. Consider who God is, what God has done. God is, according to Genesis, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Everything is attributed to God uh, Genesis 1 and 1 begins, in the beginning God, meaning before the beginning God already was. And you could say like Jesus said before, Abraham was, I am. So you can say that God is tenseless. He's not past, present, and future. He merely is. He is, was, he is, is, he is, will be, but he is, essentially is. Um, when you consider that he is who he is. The fact that he has given us a means to have a relationship with him, to communicate with him, to develop intimacy with him means that he has granted us what we call prayer as a gift to us, as a gift to us. Now, that gift originally could be you could say in the Old Testament was manifested in terms of a sacrifice because individuals would sacrifice animals in order to atone for their sins so then the sacrifice of the animal was what gave the person access to God you know without the shedding of blood no forgiveness of sins so Old Testament individuals looking for access to God made sacrifices of animals and those sacrifices allowed them to enter into God's presence. So the sacrifice was God's gift to Old Testament believers, gift to them in order to give them access to God and to enter into God's presence. We are New Testament believers. So God was laying the foundation for teaching us that principle later. And when I say that we are New Testament believers, I believe that now our access, based on scripture, into the presence of God, our ability to enter into God's presence is based on another sacrifice 
that sacrifice sacrifice was made by Jesus Christ who is the lamb of God according to scripture slain from the foundation of the earth so look at what God does God says I'm sovereign I'm unlimited I am from everlasting to everlasting I have created these creatures in my image I want to have relationship and intimacy with them so I'm going to give them access into my presence. They messed up in the garden, but I'm going to provide them a means to atone for sins by making sacrifices. And I will view those sacrifices as representing them so that they can come into my presence. So what happens in the New Testament? The same principle is honored because the shedding of blood allows for the forgiveness of sins. And now that which is sacrifice is literally the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood, who gave his life at the cross that we might continue to enter into God's presence. And what he did, he did once and for all so that we don't have to keep running back to the temple to make continual sacrifices to keep having access to God or to have the privilege of entering into God's presence. Let's start with Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Good to see you, Sister Clark. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. There in Hebrews 10, the author of Hebrews recognizes the fact that our access to God, that our ability to come into God's presence is based on what Jesus Christ has done for us at the cross. Okay, so what's our first point? Prayer is a gift to us from God. It originated in terms of sacrificing animals as a response to our sins. And then in the New Testament, the Lamb becomes Jesus Christ, who does what he does for us once and for all. Now, let's, let's, we're staying here in section one. How should we pray? Keep this in mind. Many people often treat prayer as a gift to God. Now, what I mean by that is, if you rush into prayer and then rush out of prayer, will you just throw some words at God? Good to see you, Marie. Will you just throw some words at God? And then you went on out, you know, to handle your business for the rest of the day? No, 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 no. That means that you are treating prayer as a gift to God. Um, it, it is important that we pray, but keep in mind, just because you say words on a regular or consistent basis does not mean that you are treating prayer as you should. You hear what I'm saying? You can, by habit, pray three times a day, but if it's something that you rush in and out of, or an experience, or a pattern of just saying something quickly to God and moving on, that's not impressive. That's not why prayer was given to us as a gift. Just because you discipline yourself to pray, if your heart's not really in it, then you're missing the point of prayer. Another thing is, if you are driven to prayer by guilt, then you are also forgetting or overlooking what prayer means because the guilty part of us has been covered by the blood of Jesus at the cross. So it is important to come to God because he invites you, because you love him, and because you want to have a conversation with him, and you want to enjoy his presence in your life, and you see that the most important thing in prayer is not what you say to him, but what he says to you because he's got a better understanding of your situation 
than you yourself have. Y'all see that? Okay. So, this is how we should pray. If we want God's favor or blessings, keep in mind, God relates to us on his terms. Good to see you, Sister Faye. God relates to us on his terms and not on ours. Which means, if he relates to us on his terms, we have to be ready to enter into his presence. You know, like the psalmist says, enter into his presence with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, Psalm 100. Be thankful unto him and bless his name, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. That's a, that's a particular kind of way to enter into the presence of God. That means I've gotten myself ready to enter into his presence. I have prepared myself. I've prepared myself emotionally. I've prepared myself spiritually to enter into God's presence because of who he is. I never forget not just what he's done. I never forget who he is. So I have a responsibility to enter into his presence in a certain way. So if I rush in, that's an affront to God. That's a disrespect to God. I got to stay in his presence long enough not to say what I came to say, but to try to hear what he has to say after I've said what I've said. So I can't be trying to limit God to a few minutes. I need to enter into his presence in a certain kind of way. Um, make note of this in Exodus 19. In, the, in chapter 19 of Exodus, God had something to say to the Israelites, but... He gave Moses commands to give them. Good to see you, Michael. He gave Moses commands to give them wherein they had to prepare for three days to come into his presence. God said, I got something to say, but we ain't going to rush into this. You know, no, it ain't about that. It's about how important what I have to say is because of who I am. And so Moses gave the people and the priests specific instructions to prepare. I mean, if you want to hear from God, you got to be ready to hear from God. So they, they prepared for three days in Exodus 19 to hear what God had to say. Everybody had to prepare. The people and the priests, along with Moses, had to consecrate themselves in Exodus 19 in order to hear from God. Why? Because he's holy. He ain't like some dude down the street or some lady you know who lives around the corner. No, this is God who you're talking about. And so you don't just run up into his presence any kind of way. Listen to um, Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron who died when they approached the Lord. Y'all see that? Two of Aaron. Now Aaron's the priest. Aaron has two sons who died because they ran up on God the wrong way. So then that's what I'm talking about. If the people are preparing in Exodus 19 for three days along with the priests, along with Moses, good to see you, Sister Yancey. Uh, if they are preparing for three days to see God, then it means you just don't come. Good to see you, Carla. If you just don't come into God's presence any kind of way. He has to be treated in a way that is commensurate with who he is, with his identity. Listen to Psalm 24, verses 3 through 5. Psalm 24, 3 through 5. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean heart, clean hands, and a pure heart. Who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Y'all see those three verses in Psalm 24? That's the psalm that begins, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. If he's all of that, good to see you, Brother Bonds, then you don't just come into his presence any kind of way because of who 
he is. So when Jesus prayed, when Jesus prayed, Jesus respected who the Father was as the Father's Son. And the Old Testament teaches us that God taught the Jews not to be casual with him when they prayed. To be casual was unthinkable to them. Jesus Christ has given us access to God. And so when we pray, we say in Jesus' name because his name is what provides us the access. But Jesus never said that God wasn't holy. So we have access, but we have access to one who is completely and absolutely holy. Do you want revelation? Do you want access to God? Then come into his presence in a certain way. And that way respects who he is, what he has done, and what he has promised to do. What did Moses have to do on the mountain when the bush was burning? We can't have no conversation, Moses, not yet. You got to take your shoes off. Why? This is holy ground. Why is it holy ground? Because God's, he's there. And because he's there, everything there is holy. You can't, it's, it is the dust, but he made it. And then he used it to make you. And because even the dust has that relationship with God, if God is there in that dust, then you got to take your shoes off, respecting the fact of who God is. Y'all with me so far? All right. Let's go to the second section. The second section is how should we pray for others? And we are connecting this section of, of this study to the fact that we hear from God in order to pray for others. The second section, how should we pray for others? All right, begin with this thought. Intercession, praying for others, originates in God's heart. Being concerned, you see that being concerned about somebody else and interceding in their situation originates in the heart of God. Why? Because God is always at work. He's always at work in behalf of others, redeeming others. He knows who needs what, when they need it, and why they need it. Now, we pray for others. Christians pray for others. I mean, you pray for others all the time. I pray for others all the time. We can pray for others, but true intercession always originates with God speaking to us first. So even though we intercede in prayer in behalf of others, it wouldn't happen if God wasn't doing the prompting. So we've got to see that true intercession, again, originates in the heart of God. It is true that we intercede for others, but it always begins with God speaking to us in some way in behalf of others. Look at Genesis 18. Make note of this, Genesis 18, verses 16 through 21. When the men got up to leave, they looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Verse 20, Genesis 18. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. 
All right. In those verses, God begins to make Abraham aware that he's going to punish Sodom and Gomorrah. God revealed his intent to Abraham. Abraham could never have, listen, on his own, Abraham could not have imagined what God was going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah without God's revelation. Now, let's go to 22. We're going to stick in Genesis 18 because I want to see, I want you to see what Abraham did after God told him what he was going to do. The men, verse 22 of Genesis 18, the men turned away and went toward Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Abraham gets the revelation, but he doesn't go anywhere. Verse 23, then Abraham approached God and said, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you, God, to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you, will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Verse 27, then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I'm nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Well, this conversation goes on and on between God and Abraham because Abraham wants to know, I hear what you say you're going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah, God, but if there are righteous people there, will you sacrifice the righteous along with the unrighteous? And God says, no, I ain't going to do it. But Abraham keeps taking the number down until he asked the Lord, what if you find 20 or what if you find 10? And God keeps saying to Abraham, well, if I find 20, I won't destroy it. If I find 10, I won't destroy it. Conversation goes on. And God, uh, finally, Abraham realized there wasn't a righteous person in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God went on and did what he said he was going to do. But I want you to see that Abraham had a Abraham had a strong desire when it came to those who were righteous before God. And he wanted, he wanted to be sure that God was not going to sacrifice righteous along with the unrighteous. Y'all see that? So what's Abraham doing? He's interceding. But he is, in this situation, he's interceding for individuals who were not in right relationship with God. And there was, according to God, not even one person in Sodom and Gomorrah who was righteous. But why did Abraham seek to intercede? Because God gave him a revelation. And because Abraham had a heart that was like God's heart, Abraham appealed in behalf of those who may have been righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. So again, intercession originates with God. Although God said, this is what I'm going to do, Abraham asked God for the ability to intercede in behalf of the righteous because Abraham was acting like God acts. Y'all see that? Those who intercede, intercede because intercession originates with God in that God interceded for us through Jesus Christ. Y'all see that? Okay. All right, um, Exodus 32, let's start with verse 9. In Exodus 32, verse 9, God says to Moses, I've seen these people, and they are a stiff-necked people. God's talking to Moses. Now leave me alone, so that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses, listen to Moses. He sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people 
whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fist's anger. Relent, God, please, and do not bring disaster on your people. Then Moses goes on to say to God, Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. So what happens? God says, I'm tired of these people, and I'm going to do something about it, Moses, but I'm going to make sure that your name is a great name. I'm going to start this thing all over again through you. And, a and Moses, what does he do? He intercedes based on a revelation. He gets a word from God, and then he intercedes for the people whom God was speaking about in that word. Listen to verse 30 of um, Exodus 32. The next day Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold, but now God, please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. Y'all see Moses interceding? He gets the revelation. The people have jacked up, and Moses knows it. But he wants God, good to see you, Mr. McCoy, but he wants God to give them another chance. And so he pleads in their behalf. And Moses said, God, let's take it this far. If you don't want to do it, then just blot me out of the book. Just take me instead of taking them. Y'all see that? That's why Moses is referred to as a deliverer. Now, a great deliverer is Jesus Christ, but Moses is a, is a deliverer as well. He is a type of Christ. There ain't but one Christ, but Moses is a type in that he intercedes and in that he leads them out of, out of bondage and into liberation. Y'all see what I'm talking about? So Moses intercedes in behalf of the people, even offering to have his legacy Blot it out. God, if you got to go so far as to just erase my name so that nobody even remembers what I did, do that because I want you to spare these people. I see my cousin Sini on the line, Miss Seabrook as well. Good to see you, Sini. All right. Now, Jesus then is our intercessor. And when Jesus observed, God at work in a certain way or in another person, Jesus would get involved as an intercessor in that situation. Listen to John 17, verses 25 and 26. Righteous Father, this is Jesus talking in his prayer. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Jesus, following the will of the Father, keeping intimacy with the Father as his priority while in the earth, was made aware of things through his relationship with the Father. And if he saw that it was the Father leading him to a certain place or to a certain person, then Jesus would intercede, having followed the will of the Father in that situation. That is the pattern for intercession today. Why do we pray? Why do we intercede for people? Because we are made aware by God of that person's situation. So listen, you know, I get, I got messages today. I got some messages today about people who wanted to be prayed for. That wasn't just like, I, I got a text from our administrative assistant, um, Carolyn.
Carolyn sent me a text saying, this person called and asked for prayer. Well, the message came from Carolyn, but we wouldn't be interceding for these people in prayer if God wasn't making the message known. So while I got the text from Carolyn, the text didn't originate with Carolyn. The text originated with God. God was making known that somebody wanted to be prayed for. And why do they want to be prayed for? Because they believe that the prayers of the righteous avail much. What does that mean if the prayers of the righteous avail much? It means that intercession is intercession is valuable. It's worth doing. But the only reason we intercede is because, because God makes known to us situations requiring the prayers of the righteous or intercession. So that's the pattern for intercession today. Jesus Christ reveals what the Father wants to accomplish through the Spirit. And so the Spirit that indwells us makes us aware of what the Father says to the Son. And then as the Spirit alerts us to that situation, we then begin to pray for that person or for that circumstance. It happens with family, it happens with friends, it happens with co-workers, it happens with fellow church workers, uh, church members, it even happens with strangers. We end up praying for people we don't even know because somebody has said something to us, that message originated with God, and because God is the original intercessor, we intercede as well because we believe that God himself is the great intercessor through Jesus Christ. So then when we intercede, it's because Jesus has invited us through the Holy Spirit to join him in the work that he's doing. He's at the right hand of, of the Father, ever, uh, ever living to make intercession for us and then using us through the Spirit to join him in the work of intercession. And when we join him in the work, then we celebrate the result. Like we get a word back, so-and-so has come through. And so we celebrate. Why do we celebrate? Because intercession is work, worth doing and it works. But then sometimes when we intercede, the person makes the transition in spite of what we have prayed about. But then we celebrate that to live is Christ but to die is gain. So even so either way, you know, either way, we are celebrating the intercession because we are participating in the work of God. And the work of God does not end with someone's passing away. It really is a commencement into the promise of God about making it to the next level. Y'all see that? Okay. All right. All right. All right, let's go to our next section. And again, I, the lesson's gonna be a little shorter today. Let's talk about a little more about prayer and intercession. Let's talk a little bit more about prayer and intercession. intercession. Prayer is not, listen, this, and I, I wanna give credit for the quote because the quote comes from Oswald Chambers. Oswald Chambers says, prayer is not the preparation for the work, it is the work. He says, it is not the preparation for the battle, it is the battle. Prayer then is not the preparation for the work, it's the work itself. You gotta, you gotta understand that, you gotta, you gotta get that. We don't, pray, we don't pray to prepare ourselves, we pray as a means of getting stuff done. So it's not the preparation for the work, it is the work. It's not the preparation for the battle, it is the battle. Here is a, the problem that we find in intercession sometimes. The tragedy of intercession is that God is always looking for someone who is willing to enter prayer with him regarding others. If God is looking, then that means that there's not enough people who are seeking to join with God 
in interceding for others. That's the tragedy of intercession, that God is looking for someone willing to enter prayer with him regarding others. Listen to two verses in Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22, verses 30 and 31. I looked for someone, God says, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. So I will pour out my wrath on them and consume them with my fiery anger, bringing down on their own heads all they have done, declares the sovereign Lord. God's looking for somebody to join in the work with him. And part of that work is intercession, interceding in behalf of others. There are few people willing to pay the real price of intercession because intercession is more than words. It's standing with someone. Saying words and walking away is very easy to do. That's not really intercession. Intercession not only includes the prayer, the words that are said, it includes standing in the gap for the person who is facing the gap. If I stand in the gap for you, that means that I have done more than petitioned God in your behalf. I have literally entered your situation. Very few people willing to pay the price. What did what did Abraham say? If you find 10, that's real intercession. God, I'm trying to stand in the gap for these people. What about Moses? God, you can block me out of the book. You can completely erase my legacy so that no one ever remembers anything I've ever done. That's intercession. That ain't just saying words. That's standing in the gap. What about Jesus in Gethsemane? Father, I'd like to pass this cup on. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That ain't just saying words. That's standing in the gap. How many people are willing to stand in the gap? Jesus stood in the gap. He stood in the gap between heaven and earth so that that gap would be filled by his death, suffering, and sacrifice. He shed his blood. He took care of that gap. He bridged the distance between us and God. And we who are believers are reconciled with the Father because of the Son. That's real intercession. It's standing in the gap. Keep that statement in mind today. Pray about that later on. All right. Let's go to our last section. Last section. We want to talk about God's pattern for prayer. God's pattern for prayer. First of all, understand we pray because God has taken the, taken the initiative to cause us to want to pray. Which means we can't even we can't even uh, attribute our desire to prayer to ourselves. We attribute it to God who does the kind of work in us that makes us desire to pray. First point, God's initiative when it comes to his pattern for our praying. He takes the initiative to cause us to want to pray. And why is that? Because by natural compulsion, we don't really want to pray. Because it's sort of like it's sort of like Adam and Eve in the garden and the, the serpent saying, Did God really say? And then Eve saying, Well, this is what he said. And then they followed the serpent's advice rather than following the advice of the one who made them. What does that suggest? That suggests he made us, but we still kind of want to do things our own way. You know, we, uh, we don't see ourselves as dependent as he might see us or 
as he might have originally indicated we are. We, we see ourselves as, as having the capacity for running our own lives our way and having everything work out all right. Thankfully, even though we don't normally seek God out by nature, he has, by making us in his image, put something in us that, that looks for him anyway. Listen to Romans 3, 10 through 12. Romans 3, 10 through 12. Paul says to the Romans, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. So we're not righteous on our own. It's the blood of Jesus that makes us so. There is no one who understands, Paul says. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Why would he even use the word good? Because in the beginning, God was the one that defined what good was. God said, when he looked at some, this is good, this is good, this is good. So then we are not the we are not the truest definers of good. God himself is. And because of that, you know, by nature, we turn away from God. Thankfully, though, God is at work in us. And the fact that we pray means that we recognize he is summoning us. Summoning us into his presence. All right? So we pray because God takes the initiative to help us to have the desire to pray. All right, we are on, we are on God's pattern for prayer. Here's the second part of the pattern. The Spirit of God reveals God's will to God's people. How does the Spirit of God reveal God's will? He does it through God's word. The Holy Spirit takes the words of Scripture and the truth of Scripture and impresses them on our minds. Let's get that again. The Spirit of God reveals God's will through God's Word. How does he do it? He takes the words of Scripture and the truth of those Scriptures, impresses them on our minds so that when we pray, specific scriptures come to mind that help us in situations. Y'all see? That's a part of how prayer reveals God speaking to us. As we, it, it's like Jesus saying in 14, in John 14, around 24, 25, 26, that the Spirit would guide us into truth, that the Spirit would bring things to our remembrance. So then as we pray, the Spirit of God reminds us of specific scriptures that are applicable to the situation that we are praying about. So we pray God speaks through the Holy Spirit who reveals God's will with the basis being scripture. Scripture is always going to be the basis because every time Jesus was confronted by the enemy, he was quoting scripture. It is written. He said it over and over again, didn't he? All right. That's in Matthew 3. All right. The third part of the pattern is this. The Spirit helps us pray. Romans 8 verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. The Spirit helps us with prayer. We are prompted to pray. We think we're saying the right stuff, but we're saying stuff based on the frailty of our own flesh. So the Spirit of God, who knows the Father, and who is known by the Father, <laughs> and who knows us, the Spirit speaks knowing us to the one who knows him the way he knows the Father. And in that way, uh, the Spirit prays, and how can we say it? He enhances our prayers by facilitating a word in prayer that we didn't think of ourselves.
because we don't know ourselves as well as God knows them. Okay? So the Spirit helps us pray. He helps us pray, keep this point in mind, in agreement. Spirit helps us pray in agreement with what God is saying and what God wants. Because our natural tendency is to meet God with unbelief. Our natural tendency is to prayer, is to pray rather, but then not to feel like the prayer has done any good. But the Spirit works in us, even as he speaks in our behalf, to align our hearts and our minds with what God is saying. So he's helping our prayers as they're presented to God, but he's helping us to hear from God because what God has to say to us is more important than what we say to him. All right, y'all see that? All right, three parts we've covered already, patterns for prayer. Let's go to the next one. God confirms, God confirms. When God gives us direction in prayer, God gives you direction in prayer, God will confirm the direction he gives you through the Bible. He'll confirm it through a circumstance. He'll confirm it through other believers. God has multiple ways of confirming to you the direction he gives you in prayer. So you say to yourself, you know, I just kind of sense, I feel like God is saying this. And then you run across the scripture or you're talking to a friend or a coworker or a loved one, or you're in the midst of a circumstance and then you see how that prayer direction is connected to that circumstance. God will confirm it. He'll confirm that you're, you're in the right place and that you're walking in the right direction. All right, what's that for? Let's go to number five in patterns for prayer. We're talking about prayer and its role in hearing God's voice. Our adjustment, consider that. When you hear from God and you know you've heard from him, adjustments must always be made. We, we then are required after we've heard from God to adjust our lives to what God has said. Because once God speaks, cannot remain the same because he's speaking about something that requires an adjustment. It is impossible to obey God without making an adjustment in order to practice that obedience. So then his word always requires adjustments. All right? What's that? Five. Number six. Once we've heard from him, we then obey because all God says means little if we do not obey him. Didn't Jesus tell a parable once about somebody, father giving his son's orders that he wanted them executed? And one son said, no, 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 no. And then he finally did it. And the other son said, yes, but never did it. <laughs> Y'all see what I'm saying? Obedience means nothing. All, all that God says, rather, means nothing if we do not obey. What he says is important. And when we acknowledge what he says, if we fail to obey, then the acknowledgement means very little. The next one, next point, two points left. God works. Once we have obeyed God, God then works through us and our obedience to accomplish what purpose he revealed to us. Y'all see that? We obey because what God says means nothing if we don't obey. And then after we obey, God works through us to accomplish what he revealed to us that we responded to by obedience. Here's the last point. After all of that has taken place, we've heard him, we've obeyed, all of that. We actually then experience God through our obedience as the Spirit revealed we would. That experience of God comes out of an obedient response to him. When God has spoken, because you have prayed, 
and you have and you have bought in to what God has said. Once you obey, then you experience the promise of God that is related to the purpose that God revealed that you exercised obedience about. So it is not just a matter of doing something in obedience to God. It's a matter of experiencing the fullness of God's presence in your life because you have obeyed. Certain things are accomplished in you. Certain things are accomplished through you. Certain things are accomplished for you because you've obeyed. Good to see you, Sister Arlene and Sister uh, Sister Inez. Bless you. Y'all see that? All right. So keep those things in mind. Now, next week, we want to talk specifically about circumstances and how we hear the voice of God in circumstances we find ourselves in. So keep that in mind. I'll post the outline ahead of time. We're still talking about hearing the voice of God. We have spent three weeks talking about prayer and the role it plays. And why do we spend three weeks? Because prayer is absolutely, good to see you, Sister Washington Miller. Janae, God bless you. Because prayer is absolutely necessary and crucial in our, in, in our ability to hear what God has to say. I appreciate y'all so much. Uh, we, are, we are fighting our way through, uh, through this, this pandemic season. And I appreciate y'all hanging in there. Don't, I, I read an article yesterday by a man who does a lot of church surveys. And I'm going to let y'all go. I know y'all got to go. But the article had was about the five groups of people who are not going to come back to church when this is over. And it's based on conversations that George Barna had and uh, statistics and all of that kind of stuff. And I understood what he meant. It's just that my prayer is that you won't go anywhere, that you will recognize that God has been keeping us and that God is bringing us through. And that even in this virtual worship and study season, that you will not become weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you faint not. So hang in there. At the end of the rope, tie knot in it. Hold on a little bit longer. I don't, I, you know what, I really don't know. I have a feeling this is going to be like this a few more months. I really do. But I also know that God is going to bring his people back together and into, into each other's presence. And so I'm looking forward to seeing you. I really do miss you. But I'm, I'm working hard on trying to make this work. And I need you to work along with me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you when that time comes. Uh, on our prayer list today, well, before we do that, food banks open Saturday. Classes for adults at 11 o'clock Sunday and for the youth at 1 o'clock Sunday um, virtual worship Sunday at 9 and prayer Monday at 6 a.m. and then Bible study again next week on Facebook live at noon I'm gonna try to get I'm gonna see if I can get us on YouTube live as well next Wednesday I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on that this week and see if I can get that done all right, uh, be in prayer for Robin Stevenson, Turner Stubbs, the family of Beverly Walker, Karen Walker, Roosevelt Haygood, Yvette Crosby, Latanya Cook. She just had surgery, and I believe that uh, things uh, went pretty well, and we're praying for Latanya. She's on the line today, matter of fact. We're praying for the Henry family, and we're praying for Dexter Henry, for Julie Lewis, and Errol Harper. Uh, we've got our longer list on Monday morning, so stay tuned. Stay tuned and stay with us Monday morning at 6 a.m. All right, let's bow for prayer. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study virtually. We thank you for the presence of your spirit. We lift up now, God, all that has been said and done. We pray that it will glorify you and advance your kingdom. We pray for those whose names we've called today and for our, our wider prayer list, God, for all of those who are members and friends and family members distant relatives, God, we pray that every need would be met. 
that you would remind us that nothing is too hard for you. God, we love you today. We praise you in advance for what you're going to do, and we thank you for what you have already done. Bless Providence today, we pray, God, individually and collectively. Return us to this place for fellowship and worship and the friendships that we have enjoyed. Return us, recover us, bless us, increase us, we pray, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again. I appreciate you, and we will look forward to seeing you Sunday at uh, Virtual Worship at 9 a.m. and uh, Wednesday Bible Study next week at noon. Have a great day. Great rest of the week to you.